Welcome everybody uh, to our uh, webinar, uh, Harness the Power of Executive Sponsorship. Uh, we have a great uh, duo here, uh, Marcy and Kel, uh, who's a founder of uh, HR Computes and uh, John Bowen with CAI. And uh, they're going to uh, you know, provide some excellent information and food for thought for you today. Um, so we're excited to have you, and thanks for joining us. And my name is Scott Rosen, uh, President and Founder of the Rosen Group. Thank you. So um, I guess it was about two years ago, um, you know, or two and a half years ago that um, uh, Morris and Chris uh, and I sat down, or probably more about webinars. So because I think um, anyway, we we got together and we talked about a partnership. Um, and, and we've established that partnership and it's been, you know, a great experience for me, um, to, to work with, uh, Morris and Chris, um, in, um, you know, kind of leveraging and, and working together synergistically, uh, with our two businesses to kind of, you know, provide better services to the HR community. So, um, you know, I'll let Morris uh, talk a little bit about his, his organization, but like, I just wanted to mention the, the partnership that we have is sort of a reciprocal, um, you know, building relationships. Um, obviously, technology, HR technology is critical, uh, particularly now in HR. Um, you know, companies are implementing and, and purchasing all kinds of different technologies, you know, in the HR space. And, and that's what uh, HR Computes is, is an expert in. Um, you know, we're a staffing company that uh, specializes in placing HR people. Um, and so, you know, we, we place a, a fair amount of, of HR technology folks. And so um, the partnership has, has, again, been been very good for both of us and, and we believe for the HR community. So we're, we're excited about the partnership. Excellent. Thank you, Scott. So, um, so yeah, I think at this point, I'm going to turn it over, Mars, to you and um, I'll let you... Um, uh, you know, talk about what you're doing today and, and whatever else you guys are going to cover about yourselves. Fantastic. Really appreciate it, Scott. Thanks. It's great to be here. John, thank you for joining. Um, and so why are we here? Well, the PMI Institute, Project Management Institute, says only 38% of projects finish on time and only 65% meet their original goals. Uh, not good success. Meanwhile, Companies are saying that they're spending more and more time and more and more of their resources working on projects. So what does that really mean? That means that the company that's going to be best able to achieve success with projects is going to be that much more successful as an organization. So that's why we're here. How do you do projects better? What roles will help us be more effective and what tools are out there? to help our team succeed. So today we're uh, lucky enough to have John Bowen and John, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, sharing some of this with you. And um, I would very much like to encourage that this be a, um, an interactive session. It's not, uh, this is not a webinar per se. I'm not gonna sit here and lecture to you. Um, or try to preach or teach. Uh, rather, we would very much like this to be as interactive as possible. Uh, over the next 45 minutes, we're going to be saying some things that may be controversial, um, may hopefully um, uh, spark some, some reaction on, on your part. And if so, please speak up. Uh, we would like this to be as interactive as possible. I'm not going to go over my, uh, my, my career here other than to say that um, uh, I've been doing this for a good number of years. Uh, I spent the, the bulk of my, my career at uh, Pennsylvania Power and Light, uh, what I lovingly refer to as PPNL. It will forever be PPNL in my mind. Um, and interestingly enough, I, while I was there, I had the distinct privilege of being of serving as the chief information officer of PPL's international operations for 10 years, the last 10 years I was with the company. And in that role, I had other CIOs reporting to me uh, from six different countries in Latin America and uh, two countries in, in Europe. And it was uh, largely as a result of that that I became 
um, intimately aware of the critical role of project sponsors in ensuring the success of projects. Uh, after retiring from PPNL, I uh, w- went to work with Computer Aid for a couple of reasons. Number one, I was very impressed with, with CAI's experience and expertise in project management. And you'll see that throughout today's presentation. Uh, we'll talk about the, um, the tools that they've developed and why they, why they felt it necessary to do so. And if you go to the next slide, I, I throw this up here simply because I, uh, after I retired from PPNL and went to work for, for Computer Aid for CAI, I, I also wanted to teach. And so I started teaching at Lehigh University in their executive education program and in the Global Village, which is part of the Iacocca Institute at Lehigh. And <clears throat> In that capacity, uh, one of the the classes I put together was the challenges of managing international projects. And so this map shows some of the more than almost almost 30 different countries around the world where I have served either, either as a project manager, a program director, or as an executive sponsor. And uh, so I, I throw it out there if any of you are interested in talking about that. Um, that uh, challenge, we can discuss that uh, a little bit further. But the, the important thing here is that while working at Computer Aid, while working at PPL, it became evident to me that the most important role in project success is the sponsor, the executive project sponsor. And in fact, number, a number of different academic studies have shown repeatedly that the number one reason that projects fail is lack of senior management support. And throughout my career, I've had the privilege of working with some wonderful executive sponsors and some who quite honestly, we're not as good. And it's not because executives are stupid people. Um, It's because no one ever taught them what it means to be a sponsor of a project. And in looking into that, I, I did some research and canvassed universities around the world and large corporations. And I found that there is no training available for executives on what it means to sponsor a project. So a couple of years ago, I put together what started out as a five-day certificate program at Lehigh. Uh, We eventually pared it down to three days. Uh, From three, we pared it down to two days. And and now it is, uh, I've actually got a one-hour version of a two-day executive class. But my point here also is that we're not going to try to teach you in the next 45 minutes everything you need to know to be an effective sponsor. Rather, if we can simply prove or demonstrate to you that it is a critical role and one that is time-consuming, unfortunately, but one that um, you absolutely have to take seriously, we will have succeeded. Now, if any of you are interested, I would be more than happy to talk to any of you about bringing some training into your organization. Um, It doesn't have to be a two-day class. It can be something less than that. But the point is that, as we'll see at the very end of this uh, discussion, it's really important that your executives receive some training in what it means to, to sponsor a project. Excellent, John. Thank you. So Morris Yankel, Uh, As Scott said, HR computes um, in partnership with the Rosen Group and on our own, we've been in business 25 plus years. Uh, It's basically all about human resources technology. What can technology do from an HR transformation perspective? What can can technology do to help human resources become and have more of an impact and insight um, to assist senior management? We've had tons of clients over that time in pretty much every kind of industry. And in general, we help folks optimize what they have, select something new, or get during implementation, really get your money's worth. Get that impact that you saw during the demo, get that to fruition. Make sure that um, you're really using what you pay for and that you're having that kind of an impact and insight for the organization through the technology. I am an inveterate networker, so a bunch of different networking organizations that I'm in, 
uh, I'd love to reach out and, and connect with people as well, same as John. So, excellent. Our first poll, Larry. So this is The Reasons Projects Fail. Uh, we'd love to get your imp impression here and um, for the top reason that you see. So I think we can see that um, there's our results. Obviously, you're playing right into our hand. Lack of top management support. We appreciate that. But we're also, we will talk through some of the other pieces and some of the tools that we've seen to help, uh, you know, not have these as reasons for failure. Excellent. John, we're going to start with you around the role and responsibilities of the project sponsor. Thank you again, Morris. And let's let's dig into this a little bit more, um, more deeply. First and foremost, I'd, I'd like to say that there are the role of the project sponsor is that of project governance. And there are two sides to project governance. There is the demand side, which says or asks, are we doing the right projects? And then there is the supply side, which asks, are we doing those projects right? And of the two, by far the most important is ensuring that the project that you are sponsoring has a valid business case and is the best use of your company or your organization's resources at that time. And I'd like to tell a little story here. When I was teaching this class at, at Lehigh in the executive education program in the School of Business, uh, one of the, the participants, I won't say students, one of the participants in my class was an executive from <laughs> a very large candy manufacturing company based in Pennsylvania. And he told me an interesting, he told the whole class, a very interesting um, uh, philosophy they have at the company. And as you can well imagine, in a candy, a candy company, there are two dates that are paramount. Uh, one is Halloween and the other is Easter. And so if you miss those windows of opportunity in a given year, you pretty much lose 50% of your revenue. And every one of their projects is justified based on a set of assumptions, assumptions on uh, market conditions, assumptions on what the, um, what the customers are, are looking for or are interested in at the time, and assumpt economic assumptions. Or what is it going to cost us to get sugar? And no surprise, 99.9% .9 of their uh, costs uh, relate to sugar. Um, and so they make decisions on a, on a bi-monthly basis. Every two months, they have a, a steering committee, essentially executives that, that get together, and they review all of the projects that are in flight, the projects that are underway, as well as all of the candidate projects that may um, be approved. And they revisit the assumptions that were part of the justification for every project that is currently underway. And if those assumptions have changed, if the business case, the economic conditions for any given project no longer suggest that that is the best use of their resources, they don't hesitate for a moment to cancel those projects. And what is most interesting is what they do next. After they cancel a project that they have deemed is no longer the best investment of their resources, they hold a celebration. They literally celebrate the fact that that project is done um, and the people and money and resources that have been allocated to it can now be redeployed into another or other projects that they are now convinced is a better use of their investment uh, resources. And so what I'm trying to say here is that the demand side of project governance. In other words, ensuring that the projects you are sponsoring are the best use of the resources of your organization. That is your number one priority. As a sponsor, you're, you're essentially beholden to two groups. Number one is your peers on the executive uh, side of the organization, and the other is the project itself. But by far, your greater responsibility is to the company, to the organization. And so if your project, however much it means to you, is not the best use of those resources, cancel it. Cancel it immediately and celebrate that fact. So there are three reasons to undertake a business project. You're either going to increase revenue, you're going to lower costs or you're going to reduce risk. 
And it should be abundantly clear to everyone who is on that project team, which of those three reasons or rationales is, is the justification for that project. So uh, on this slide, we're just looking at some of the responsibilities of the project sponsor. I've already talked at length about identifying the business need, the problem or opportunity, ensure and prove that there is a business case that remains valid throughout the life of the project. Hire or assign or somehow get yourself a project leader. And we'll talk about project management versus project leadership in a few minutes. Translation means every project that I've ever been involved with develops its own language. There is project speak. There are acronyms and, and shorthand notations of what you're talking about. Everyone on the project in, from the project manager down is going to learn this language and talk project speak. The project manager is going to talk to you, the project sponsor, in that same language. It is your task to translate that gobbledygook from the project into business language that your peers, the other executives, the other CXOs, will understand. And so the ongoing translation of what the status of the project is, the justification for the project, that translation role is yours throughout the life of the project. And then, of course, ensure that the resources the project needs, when and as they need them, are made available. That's your job. Unfortunately, too many executives think that the role of a project manager is to sit through boring status meetings and sign checks. It's much more than that. You've got to make sure that the resources are available. So here's a, a very good definition of the project sponsor, one who justifies, enables the project to become established, as we've already said, oversees, maintains corporate accountability, delivery of that project through the appointment and appropriate support of a suitably qualified and empowered project manager and the project team. Um, and we'll talk about project leadership in a little bit. Now, definition of the project sponsor. There are a couple of items here. Uh, we've talked about visionary. One of the, the roles of the project sponsor that you may or may not like is that of a cheerleader. And I've said this to a lot of executives and they say, that's not my job. I'm not gonna go run around and, and wave pom-poms. But unfortunately you must because your peers had their own candidate list of projects. They were not selected, yours was. And throughout the life of your project, you have to remind your peers why your project is the best use of corporate resources and will return the best return on investment. And you've got to do that throughout the life of the project because you want your peers to be as supportive of that project as you will be of theirs when theirs are selected. So Morris, I didn't know if you wanted to challenge any of these roles? <clears throat> I did. I want to challenge, give you a chance to take a breath. The, uh, the unblocker, I love the definition there. And, um, you know, I, I just wanted to better understand how, how would a, um, how was the sponsor going to do that? How do you unblock things? Well, as I said, um, there's a lot of negotiation that goes on. There's a lot of um, bartering, quite honestly. Um, one of the most important roles on any project is that of the um, subject matter experts. Uh, they have to come from the business units, from the business lines. And invariably, every one of them has a full-time job. And as much as we would like the subject matter experts to be completely freed from their day-to-day -day tasks and assigned to the project for its duration, which I have had the luxury of, of having in, in, in some very large projects, that doesn't happen very often. And so as an unblocker, it's important for you as the executive sponsor to go to your peers and explain to them and persuade them why it is important enough for them to free up some time of their staff so that they can work with the project team to define the requirements, to approve the deliverables, to test some of the results of the project, um, to work together to develop the training that is going to be needed as this project gets rolled out. And so at the same time, all of your peers are silently, perhaps not so silently, um, trying to persuade their 
other peers that perhaps this isn't the best project for the organization. And so there's constantly a, a struggle going on. So as the unblocker, it's your task to basically be in front of the scrum and um, ensure that the, the resources are needed when um, and as needed by the project. I like it. The other one that was really interesting to me is the planner item. So I certainly can understand how the sponsor would be involved in the planning. But then because you're so much involved in the startup planning, how do you switch over to being the reviewer? An excellent question. Um, and I think it's important to say here that uh, many executives would come back and say, it's not my job to plan this project. And that's what I have a project manager for. Well, Yes, you do have a project manager who is responsible for ensuring the way the work breakdown structure is complete, that all tasks um, are assigned to people who are qualified and have the appropriate training and tools to get the job done. But it's your job as sponsor to, to validate the, the credibility and feasibility of that project plan. Does it make sense? Does it pass the smell test? Does it look like a project plan that is actually going to achieve our results within the, the bounds that we have in terms of budget and, and time? Then once the project's underway, there will inevitably be scope changes. And so it is your task as project sponsor to approve those scope changes. Every one of them is going to be documented. Every one of them is going to be just justified. But it is your role as the project sponsor to approve that, yep, we're going to include that in, in this project plan. And presumably as a good sponsor, you will have set aside contingency budgets to allow those those changes to be included in scope without having to go back to a steering committee pleading for more money. Great point. Excellent. Now, very often people ask, what's the difference between project sponsorship and project management? Um, I think this particular uh, slide says it very well that project sponsorship is responsible for identifying, defining the project, whereas project management is concerned with delivering on that project. Um, one of the, the interesting discussions that has to take place between the sponsor and the project manager early on is how are we going to manage this project in terms of metrics? And so typically, uh, essentially, you as the sponsor and the project manager sit down and decide, these are the key performance indicators that we are going to be monitoring throughout the life of the project. The project team is responsible for feeding data into those metrics. The project manager is responsible for feeding those metrics to you, the project sponsor. And you as project sponsor are responsible for monitoring and measuring and tracking those key performance indicators and raising red flags when things seem to be going off track. And then finally, um, I'll beat this dead horse. The project sponsor is responsible for ensuring that the business case remains valid throughout the life of the project, and you should never hesitate to recommend canceling a project if the business case no longer justifies it. Hey, John, we had a question. Um, this is Scott from, uh, from an audience uh, participant uh, perspective. The question is, who should the executive sponsor be for a human capital digital transformation? That's an interesting question for both me and Morris. Um, first of all, if it's a um, organization-wide uh, initiative, in other words, one that is uh, affecting uh, human resources across multiple divisions or branches of the company, then I would suggest that you have um, an executive steering committee of multiple sponsors. Uh, and I've been involved in very large projects where we had, uh, in one case, there were seven vice presidents and the, um, the chief information officer. Um, and there were a lot of HR issues in, involved in that project as well. But again, if it's unless it's just one organizational unit that is being impacted, in which case, clearly the sponsor would be the, the senior most executive of that particular division or branch. But if it transcends multiple silos or multiple columns within the organization, I think you need to have multiple um, executives acting together. I, I agree, John. I think it's a, a cool question because 
a lot of times in HR, you find that an executive sponsor may be um, the VP of total rewards because HR technology may sit under, you know, within their purview. Um, but I, I do think that from talking to you and seeing some of the things we've been going through in a couple of different projects recently, that next level up of the CHRO um, really is crucial to this sort of sponsorship. So I think that, you know, where we're talking here a lot about the executive sponsor, I think to your most recent point there, it's about having a sponsorship team that can do that communication up. The way that you said you're talking project speak versus business speak, I think that that is crucial to having the voice at the, you know, the, the C, the C table, the suite at the, the, the seat at the table. Um, in, if, for example, in a project that we're currently doing, uh, it is concentrating on a full transformation of HR from applicant to retiree. We're changing every system in there. And so to have uh, on an active basis, the uh, vice president of total rewards is important. That's compensation, it's performance evaluation, um, actually uh, uh, talent acquisition reported into that person. And then of course, HR tech. But now when you start to talk about things like benefits or you start to talk about succession planning or you start to talk about learning management, those pieces we're also implementing. So at that point now, bringing in either the VP at that level into the sponsorship role or the CHRO um, becomes crucial because of all the reasons that we're seeing here. So great question. Very good question. Uh, and very often people ask me you know, exactly who's responsible for what. And so I think this slide is a great one for you to have in your hip pocket. Uh, there is a pocket pal version of this. Uh, ha -ha. Um, basically it's saying, given the various activities from organizational accountability, project execution, uh, who does what in terms of leading the project team, et cetera. I think this is a great slide for, um, for you to, to review uh, at your leisure after the fact. And it also um, reminds me to, to tell all of you participants today that um, after this presentation, we will be happy to send you a full version of a PDF copy of my presentation on um, executive project sponsorship. Uh, it's got a lot of information, a lot of detail, a lot of um, uh, specific tasks that you as sponsor are responsible for throughout the life of the project, from project inception, through early planning, through project kickoff, through project execution, and eventually project closure. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But um, I think this slide is a great way for you, you and your project manager uh, to, to get on board with each other and understand this is my task. This is my responsibility. This is yours. And I'm not going to get in your way. So just a good slide. Our next poll, Larry. Do you have project sponsors in your organization on every major project? And I'm kind of wondering here for those seven or eight people who said um, one of the reasons projects fail in their organization is because not enough involvement at senior management or not necessarily right direction at senior management. Are those folks, do you have project sponsors? So getting your input here, appreciate it. Now having a project sponsor and then having a project sponsor who is involved and is active on the project are two different things. But, you know, part of the reason here that we think this is a valuable uh, conversation is because even as a project manager or as a project team member, there are some things that you have to do it in a politically correct way, but there are some things that you can do to help educate uh, and inform the project sponsors. So there you go. Excellent. You know, a good, interesting follow-up question, which we, we probably should, should include in the future would be, do you provide training for your executives in what it means to be a sponsor of a project? Um, so we can talk about that toward the end of this. Excellent. So one of the things that we said we would talk a little bit about, and this is in no way uh, trying to sell you on, on this particular product, but we have had success using something like this around the voice of the project team. So this is a screen that is uh, within this tool 
basically we're gathering the voice of the project team and then the tool helps you to understand how do you res- how do you read and respond to those responses how do you really listen and then how do you prove that you've listened and these project um, pulses these early warning sign um, uh, different ways that we're sending out and requesting folks to be engaged and to give us their feedback read into this kind of a dashboard to show what types of what is the voice of the team around something like change management in this case you can see um, it's it's in red whereas stakeholder um, communication is in green but how do these things tie in and this is a little bit around the ai of the tool how do these things tie in to the success of the project up here the probability of the success of this project is only 65 percent so that gives you an early warning sign um, to say what's going on with the project how do i drill down and find out more so in many cases the this tool we've used it for a large team across uh, cultural team, crossing time zones. One of the things that this does is, and what we're talking about here are surveys of different length, surveys of different questions based on where are you during the project? Are you in the planning stage? Are you in initiate? Are you in kind of implementation and you know the, the bulk of the project? Asking different questions during different time periods to different roles within the organization. So project managers or project assistants potentially get different questions than do subject matter experts or analysts or sponsors or vendors or consultants. And in this tool, you can create new roles and then assign questions to that role, assign a survey to that role. Um, So on the left-hand side, you can see that it's showing that Well, we've got some pieces here that are healthy. We've got other pieces here that are not so good. Uh, And then on the right-hand side, in this case, we've got a participation rate. People have filled out the survey and at 100%. So the other thing this uh, kind of a tool does is it increases the communication during the project. In a cross-cultural or cross-time zone team, um, in order for someone to potentially do phone interviews or Zoom interviews, with the entire team could would take just a, a huge amount of time uh, and for that matter money. Um, this is a way to get that on a regular basis. But it also shows you how engaged your team is. So another example for us with a project, um, we had a relatively low participation rate and that indicated to the project team and to the sponsor certain areas, uh, certain countries in fact, where participation rate was very low. So now you can have a private conversation with those folks around why are they not participating in the survey? Or you can double back and talk to the project manager. Are those people engaged during project team meetings? Do they attend those meetings? Do they come to those meetings prepared? In order to understand maybe some reasons for why are they not taking the engagement survey? Why are they not participating? But I think it's Um, What we learned was consistent communication. Um, It's a way to provide a status update. And so here, the other piece it shows is a trend line. So for example, over here under resource availability, uh, 48 is not a good score and the trend line is going down. So people have gotten busy during the project. Um, A look with the sponsor at other projects that resource might already be or has been newly assigned to is the kind of thing that can really help someone make the business case for the fact that they are not available for a project or they need some backfill for a role that they've already been you know, undertaken as their daily, daily role. And you can kind of get the look here that you know, in general, things are more yellow or orange or red, and there's an understanding visually of, okay, I could see why this might be 65% probability of success. So it's taking at that detail level, it's taking that information, that data, and turning it into information that enables the sponsor to show uh, upwards, to speak to the business, how is my project doing, 
but it also helps the project sponsor and the manager to go the other way and look down into what are the items. A couple other things. You pr help predict risks. It also can confirm that you're utilizing best practice. So uh, a story here for an implementation that we did, um, and it turned out that we were getting very low scores around training. People said that there wasn't training available, that you know it wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't something that they knew how to get or, or they felt that they were ill-prepared for um, certain things during the, the implementation. And really what it was was a communication issue. There was a ton of training that was available. It was available online. It was available just in time. It was, you know, the Zoom, uh, Zoom or um, sort of YouTube type training, as well as quick guides, as well as classroom training. But those folks who were rating it low, it was not in their time, <clears throat> excuse me, time zone potentially, or they just weren't aware of it. So there was where there was a score that was low that we were able to rectify by just increasing the amount of communication. And you don't have to always, you know, you don't want someone to be pinpointed to say, hey, I, I see it's you who gave this bad score or a low score to this item. You can announce it in the project meeting. So seeing that people are questioning whether or not you had training available enables you in the next project status meeting to put a slide in there about here's the link to uh, training, additional training. Here's how you sign up for uh, a real time or a Zoom session. So um, those were a couple of pieces. The other one is that's really um, very interesting is to be able to learn from past issues. So in the case of a, a rollout that you may be doing that's country by country, or first you're gonna do core HR or payroll, and then you're gonna do learning, and then you're gonna do whatever applicant tracking or onboarding, et cetera, learning and seeing what kinds of issues did you have during one module rollout enables you to think ahead, hopefully, uh, or change the way you're doing some things in order to have success with another module. And then the last thing I'm going to say here on this, um, well, two last things, never the last thing, two <laughs> things is that this tool also provides utility to a sponsor who is uh, potentially over more than one project or a project management office that has, you know, 25 projects. So again, it's taking information from the project team quickly and easily on an accurate, validated and regular basis. And over here may be hard to see, but this says that there are three projects. And so you can see two of them are in the red under this um, requirement stability and one of them's in orange. So now as a project management office or as a sponsor, you may want to kind of think about why are most of my projects not understanding or believing that requirements are, are stable or we don't do a good job at change management. Now that gives you, again, insight into areas that you'd be able to sort of beef up or that you'd be able to look into in order to make some changes there on a kind of global level across all projects. So that's another piece that's very, um, very important here. And then one last, this is true, the last thing is around the ability to do this kind of polling to a larger population. So your project team is, is you know, number one here. But what about your users? What about managers? Yes, they're users, but in a different way, maybe than employee self-service. Or what about folks after you've gone live? Being able to send out this kind of a poll that asks for their impressions or their early warning signals or um, other items that they're concerned about. And there is also a space in here, I, I really like two spaces, one around comments, open-ended comments. And the other one is, is there anyone on the project who deserves extra praise? I think that's one of the things, John, and I love the fact that you said, let's celebrate when we close down a project. Mm -hmm. I've been on a project or two that got closed down and boy, nobody wants to look at anybody because you feel as if you it's a failure. Well, it's not necessarily a failure on your part if it's no longer a good business decision. And in this case, you would be getting feedback on um, the satisfaction level and on what people are thinking about as you move forward. So a couple different things around that piece. And then just to say, those kinds of tools also are something that helps a project manager be a better project leader. 
And that's my perfect transition, John, back to you. Okay, thank you, Morris. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> before I finish here talking about leadership versus management, um, I, I just wanna uh, explain to a certain extent why CAI developed this tool. And there's a story around that. Um, <clears throat> there was a time where CAI had a, um, a very large project underway in, in Florida. And um, it was with one of the major cruise lines. And it was a huge, huge project. And we assigned our, our best and most experienced project manager. And every month, he, it was a he in this case, uh, provided a status report and everything was green. Until one evening, the CEO of the, um, the cruise company called the founder and, um, and owner of, of CAI and said, you have a problem. Not we have a problem. You have a problem. And <clears throat> bottom line was the project was not green. It had gone from green to red overnight. And <clears throat> so obviously the first thing we did was we sent, we darkened the skies with eagles, um, as the phrase goes. We sent a bunch of people down to get the project rightened um, and under control. And then we hired a consultant and she did what you would do as a consultant. She interviewed everybody re involved with the project and ask all the, uh, the kinds of questions you would ask. Um, you know, where, was the project sponsor involved? Uh, a whole bunch of questions. And the bottom line is that it turned out that people knew there were problems with the project, but no one had ever asked them about it. And so the project manager, not because he was a, a mean person or a bad person, it was simply because he had so many years of experience that he was confident, truly confident that he could turn this project around without having to bother anybody. Well, it turns out he couldn't without help. And so the founder of CAI said to himself, I will never be surprised with a phone call like that ever again. And so he gathered a team and he said, let's find out what the early warning signs of impending project failure are and put together a tool that can help us identify the existence of those early warning signs in time to correct a project before it goes off the rails. So that was the genesis of, um, of, of this tool called True Project. And <clears throat> So the original purpose of it was to be an, an early warning sign. However, what we've since learned is that, as it says on this slide, successful projects are led, not managed. You can't lead a project to success. You have to manage it to, you can't manage a project to success. You have to lead a project to success. So on the next slide, I did so, a, a great deal of research on this, and it turns out that um, there is a, a, a change that's been evolving in the Project Management Institute over the last 10 years. It's an acknowledgement that the skills in the column on the left, what has traditionally been referred to as project management is in fact project administration. And the skills in the column on the right are the skills that a project leader needs to have to ensure that the project is completed successfully. Um, just as an, another quick story, uh, a couple of years ago, a colleague and I went to New York City and we met with the chief technology officer of one of the major broadcasting companies. And he vented, he said, John, I'm frustrated because I can't, he said, all my project managers are PMP certified, but I can't rely on them to manage the project team or the project itself. He said, all I can do is rely on them to manage the project schedule. <clears throat> he said, what do I do? And we said, unfortunately, you've only got two choices. You can either try to take your existing project managers and try to give them leadership skills training, or you can hire people who have proven leadership skills and take your existing project managers and assign them to be a project administrator at the side of these new project leaders. And of course, that always raises the question, can you teach someone leadership skills if it's not part of their innate personality? And we won't get into that at this point. But what we found is that True Project, in addition to being an effective tool for identifying early warning signs of project impending issues is also a great tool for ensuring that your project managers are in fact leading the project teams effectively. And so if you look at the column on the left, those are really the administration uh, tasks that are traditionally managed and supported by 
traditional project management tools like Microsoft Project, Primavera, et cetera. There is no other tool that we're aware of that allows you, that provides the same support and the same tracking and the same um, administration of the leadership skills in the column on the right. I think, John, to this point also, in, um, in my experience, there are times when project management is something that is said to be provided in a contract with a, a software vendor. Mm -hmm. And so they come in saying, oh yeah, we will project manage for you. Well, project management, when it's give us your data by Tuesday, you know, here's a high level milestone, or you will have testing completed by Thursday. Uh, that's one thing. But when you're talking about, are people committed? Do they have the motivation? Do they truly understand and have the focus to know that in order to provide that data by Tuesday, They've got 25 steps along the way that right. they need to take internally. I think that's something that this really spoke to me about. That action and energy, a sense of urgency. To me, a project leadership really helps provide that. And so this was a cool list to me to think about when I would be talking to a software vendor or a project implementation team. Um, somebody who's coming into my organization and saying, they're going to help me manage the overall project. Well, what really kind of tasks are they going to do? Are they doing management? Are they doing administration? Or are they doing leadership? So, yeah. great point. I think that takes us to our third poll. So there you go. Do you use any kind of a tool like this that's going out and getting the voice of the customer or helping you in some way identify early warning signs? Great. Okay, um, I mentioned earlier on that um, the sponsor is um, engaged and involved in every phase of the project. Uh, this is just one slide from the full deck uh, that talks about the sponsor's critical role in project closure. And I'm not going to read it to you. Um, I think the most important thing here is number the last one, celebrating success and ensuring that all of the business value for which the project was justified is realized. And so it's a bitter pill to swallow for a, a sponsor to, to realize that that's, that's his or her responsibility, but in fact it is. Um, so we can, again, we could talk John, about that. The, there, was, there was a couple on here that, that I was interested in. It says finalize the vendor relationship. So I think it's interesting, especially if that relationship is around software. Um, and I mm -hmm. think that uh, one of the pieces that I've seen is that a sponsor can be very, very involved during the project, like in there discussing things, ratcheting it up to the CEO of the vendor, you know, or, or high level development people and really kind of maintaining that high level relationship that a project manager or the director of comp or whatever can't necessarily have with a vendor. Um, and that's something to me, what, what's the sponsor's role kind of going forward? Yeah, they finalize the vendor relationship here, but what happens moving ahead? Uh, and uh, excellent question. Uh, boy, I could talk for days on this. Um, in my role in as a CIO, uh, I, I was the person responsible for maintaining vendor relationships. And as you say, um, the project manager goes away. The project manager goes on to the next project and but the ongoing relationship between the vendor or vendors and the company, which the sponsor now represents, is, is, a, is a partnership. And you know we've all heard the old phrase that the moment you reach into your drawer for the contract, the relationship is over. Um, but it is an important thing that the, um, when I say finalizing the vendor relationship, on, on the one hand, it means making sure that the, the vendor has the support organization in place, that all of that knowledge has been transferred effectively to the in-house support organization as well. But it also means that the relationship between the sponsor and the, the vendor executive level is, is a an ongoing relationship, not one where we say, well, thanks very much. We bought your product. We're, we're good. No, it, it's got to be what are you going to be doing for us in the future? What is your, your rollout strategy? How are we going to be able to take advantage of, of enhancements, et cetera? So it's an ongoing relationship. That's great. 
So um, we do have another participant question. Um, <clears throat> the question is how does client side project management for implementation impacts success? So I, I could take that. I mean, I, I think that um, when I'm saying project management versus project leadership, and I, I love the way John put that, that client side piece is, it's an additional service that someone is providing during an HCM transformation, right? The vendor is giving you or renting you the software. The vendor or an implementation partner is hands on the keyboard doing the work around getting the system um, configured. The client side support is more about the leadership part. It's more about how is this system gonna rock our world? How are these things going to change? And how do we make the biggest impact for Go Live? So for example, the one example that I give a lot of times is you have a thousand employees and you have 500 job codes. That's an awful lot of jobs. Um, and you probably, that's probably not accurate, but that's a detail that potentially a project management type role is going to say, fine, just give them over here. We'll load them into the system. In order to get the reporting that you want, in order to see FLSA and EEO and accurate data and uh, metrics analytics, you know, BI, you're going to need to dig into that data. And that's the thing that a client side um, support person can really help you now. Explain the difference, explain the end game and get involved and try and help you move that, move that ahead. Thank Great you. Uh, John. Yeah, we've got two more slides. Um, and Morris loves these two. <laughs> this one is 10 ways for a project sponsor and executive sponsor to doom a project. Um, again, we can, uh, I'm not going to read them to you. Uh, I think sure, some I had, I had one or two, John, that I was going to ask you about. All right. um, you know, you're not getting the buy-in of the stakeholders and the executive um, team. How or what does a sponsor need to do on that? Number seven. Yeah, number seven. Um, and this is where I, I said early on that the sponsor has to be a cheerleader. The sponsor has to be a negotiator. Um, at the C-suite, it's, it's constantly giving and taking. Um, you've persuaded your peers that this is the best investment of the organization right now. This project is underway. Um, there will come a time when this project is over and your peers are going to say, okay, um, I gave you the subject matter experts you needed for your project. Now it's time to reciprocate. Um, and so it really is a, a negotiate. It's all about relationships at that, at that level. Um, and so if you're not getting a uh, buy-in of the stakeholders, then um, you, it, it simply falls down to or falls on to uh, the relationship you have with your peers that you've, you've, got to get, you've got to get them on board. And then um, on a more positive side, these are 10 ways for the sponsor to help a project be successful. Um, ensure the business case is valid. Again, there are three reasons to undertake a business project. Um, getting the key stakeholders aligned, which is all about relationships, uh, ensuring that the project um, has the resources it needs, uh, that there's an effective communication plan, that that communication plan is being executed by the project team, by the project manager. Um, well, that, John, I'm sorry to interrupt. That's another one that piqued my personal interest. The communication plan um, seems to me like something that, you know, you, you communication theory and who's your audience and what's your media and you know those kinds of things some folks kind of think well that's we don't need that kind of level of depth but if you think about an hcm transformation you've got a ton of different audiences and how you speak to employees for employee self-service or managers or how you speak to senior folks about dashboards or bi or whatever it's different and the message that you need to give them and the way that it's consumed is just crucial to that so I love, I would love to have, um, usually they are, in my experience, a sponsor might sign off on the communication plan, but constantly revisiting it and saying, we're at this phase, how are we changing? How are we going to communicate? And what's, what's our uh, experience? What results have we seen from communications? I think that's fabulous. Well, and that's where a tool like, like True Project, which is constantly polling all stakeholders and specifically asking them, 
is the communication from the project team effective? Um, and so there's a great way to get a, a, a feedback loop going there. So final slide here. Um, I'm, my recommendation to everyone is that you should provide training to senior management in the role and responsibilities of project sponsor. Ship. Unless an executive has risen through the ranks of project management throughout his or her career, there's a good likelihood that they do not understand the scope of this responsibility. And as the, the quotation that, um, uh, that Moore showed very early on, in, in the next five years, 60% of every executive's time is going to be devoted to oversight of projects. And if they don't understand what that means, we're here to help. There it is. Great. And go ahead, Scott. Oh, no. Um, do you have a final word there, Marsh? Because I well, want to gonna... stick to our time. Yeah. It's, you know, contact me if you have any questions. Uh, you are going to get a PDF of it, the much larger, many more slides, but a lot of good things there. And both John and I connect with us via LinkedIn or on, through email. Um, appreciate great. it. Thanks for the chance. Go ahead. Thank you. So I um, just want to thank John and Morris for doing a great job here today. As a reminder, uh, we are going to, I think, send out the recording um, it, to the um, uh, particip uh, participants today. Um, thank you guys so much. And I uh, just want to close with, um, if you guys are doing some things in the areas, you, the participants that um, are uh, best practices in terms of project management. Um, there's an awards program called the HR Department of the Year Awards. Um, this You can get all the information basically by going to hrawards.org uh, or you can contact Morris or myself as well. So uh, thank you guys. Uh, we're right on time. It's one o'clock. So um, thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to uh, connecting with uh, with you in the future. So have a great day. Mm -hmm.